Deep, how's it going? What's up? Doing well. How are you? Great. So we finally come down into the stack. We have we've the... gone all the way down. We're at your favorite part of it. Federation. The Federation. And with us, we have a very special guest today. One of uh, the founding fathers of Service Fabric. Hello. Awesome. Yeah. Hello. So, who are you? Yeah, my name is Lou. Uh, I'm one of the oldest members in the team. Oldest in terms of having been here the longest. Not the longest, I would say Kapoor is probably the longest, right? Rich yeah. is about the same time as Kapoor. I joined uh, in the incubation around 2005. Hmm. Yeah. This is quite a while, because most of the people we've, we've interviewed so far have been post-2009. Yeah, probably 2009, uh, for people like Alex, Ryan Masu, etc. Yeah, Masu was actually a bit earlier. Yeah. So we've met Mansoor, AP, Alex, we've covered yeah. RA, we've covered FM, we've talked about the CM, uh, and now we're here to talk about the Federation. So okay. we'd love to hear, you know, a little bit about that. Okay. So tell us about the Federation. Okay. Yeah, so Federation is kind of a pretty special component, because like I mentioned, in the, when we, when Kapoor, Rich, and I were doing the incubation, uh, federation is the only component, right? At that time, there's nothing at the higher layers, not even in our vision, right? So, um, so what was the initial vision? The initial vision is basically the federation layer used in like internet scale, right? So it's not even considered to be used in data center, and uh, today. Uh, a big focus for us is about consistency. At that time, it was designed to be a best effort system, right? For example, if you think about BitTorrent, right? That's internet skill, right? You have a lot of different users, uh, and all the users are very dynamic, right? So, so they will come up, they go down at random time. So that's what we were initially thinking about, right? We the skill we were thinking about is like a million number of nodes. But today in a data center, the largest thing we have in production is probably like thousand nodes or maybe two thousand nodes. Uh, in experiments we have tried, I think the maximum maximum is five thousand. That's still way below one million, which we were initially thinking, right? But like I said, initially that's for the internet scale. And now the actual usage is for data center. So that's very mm. different. Uh, so another thing that's special about federation is that because it's the lowest layer. So if you look at almost the, all the other layers, failover, right, or class manager, etc., they are really just part of the entire scenario. They cannot, or it's very hard for people to just say, okay, I want to use failover, but not the other stuff. That's almost impossible. The federation is very independent. Uh, so it's quite possible that you just take out federation and of course the transport that's been used federation and we can use federation in a lot of other different distributed applications, which can be entirely different from service fabric itself, right? So in that sense, it's it's a generic purpose platform. Wow. Hmm. So if you could describe in one sentence, what is the problem that the Federation solves? <laughs> okay. So Federation, as the name says, right, it's basically tries to group uh, the distributed processes into a logical federation. That's what it's about, right? So if we look at the detail, then it's mostly about uh, we want to know what nodes are in the federation, meaning what nodes are up, what nodes are down, right? And once you have such a logical structure, then we can um, uh, have various communication mechanisms in the ring or in the in the federation, I should say, uh, including not only, for example, point to point. Uh, messaging, but the more important thing is I can do routing, which is, I think, probably a big topic we, we are going to talk about today. Uh, routing means that the destination does not have, have to be a physical node. 
it could be a logical note, right? Uh, like for physical point-to-point -point messages, like A want to send a message to B, I know B is there, so that's why I can send a message to B. But for routing, the destination is logical. I'm saying I want to send to destination X, but who owns this X? Uh, in another word, who is going to receive this message that's targeted to X? It could be B or it could be C. That's why it's logical. Um, so, uh, in, and in addition to routing, we also have broadcast. So that's the messaging mechanism. And uh, in addition to those, we also can do like lead election. But lead election is very much tied to this routing concept. Mm. Right? Uh, if we talk about the, the history, maybe it may make things a bit more clear, right? Um, you know, DHT or distributed hash table, that was a hot topic when we initially started to work on uh, Federation. And uh, in fact, Federation is a kind of DHT system. Let me just give more maybe context in case maybe some people do not know what DHT is. Uh, as a distributed hash table, it means that there are a bunch of nodes, right? Uh, they, they form this distributed hash table federation, and every node is responsible for some keys, right? Or you can say, because it's a hash table, it's the, like the hash key. Um, so which node will own which keys that's dynamically decided at runtime, uh, not statically configured? So almost in all DHT system, every node has a node ID which is the same case for, for our federation layer. And um, the, the hash table, the key space, will also be uh, modeled as the same number space as your node ID. Like in, uh, in our case, we use 128-bit uh, as the node ID. But this node ID, the 128-bit, can also be considered as the hash key. Then we can say, okay, whichever node whose ID is closest to the hash key will own this hash entry. So that's that's basically a, a very simple way to assign uh, ownership, right? You assign the, the, the keys to the nodes without ambiguity. If every node agrees on what nodes are in the system, right? So because this is very good for failover. It kind of naturally solves the failover problem, right? And with such a DHT, then whenever someone wants to store some value or to look up some value, he will just need to find the node whose ID is closest to the key. Then uh, if you store some value, the other guy is guaranteed to achieve the same value. Assuming the federation is stable, meaning there's no other nodes that's closer to the to the key come up after the store, or uh, mm. uh, and also the node that has the the value did not go down, right? Of course, so, so those are the conditions. So that's a DHT system. Um, from here, you can see that this key is a virtual. Mm. That's how the routing is done, right? In a DHT system, if you want to store some some value, or if you want to retrieve some value for a key, basically you perform a routing to that key. And that's, as I, as I said, it's a virtual ID concept. Uh, and the, the actual node which hosts this value may be B or maybe C, or it really depends on what nodes are actually in the, in the federation. Hmm. Yeah, so that's the DHT idea. Of course, service fabric, like I said, the actual usage is very, very different from initially how we uh, uh, how we build the system, right? Because our first customer is uh, is a SQL, or uh, right now it's called uh, Azure database. Um, for that, we don't want to store really the data using DHT, right? Because we want to store the data in on the SQL database. And DHT, although it's very simple, very elegant, but it does have a problem in that it's not very stable, right? So imagine you have some node or a database, it's serving some key. 
uh, and that node has no problem. But suddenly, just because another node whose ID is closer to this key come up, then if we are doing purely DHT, you have to migrate your data from the existing server to this new server, right? Because that server is closer to the, to the ID. Mm. That's probably not very desirable, especially if the data volume is large because you are moving a lot of data, right? Yeah, so in the actual proper that we are not really using the DHT aspect. Mm. We are only using like the messaging aspect. Uh, that's kind of the <laughs> interesting history. But in the today in our federation, we does use routing. But most of the time when we route, we are just routing to the destination node ID. So it's kind of both virtual and also physical. Physical in the sense that it's it's not a random ID. It's the it's the ID of the node that I want to talk to, right? Mm -hmm. In that sense, uh, it's physical. But it's also logical in the sense that in a normal peer-to-peer uh, -peer message, if you want to send a message, let's say from A to B, you need to know bits address, right? I, I need to know your IP address, uh, the port that you are listening to, right? Because that's the physical uh, information that I need to establish, let's say, a TCP connection. But for for our, for example, failover over layer, failover over manager does not keep track of this information, right? It, it, it just know, okay, uh, node X right now hosts my replica, and I only have its node ID. I don't even know its IP address or whatever, this kind of low-level information. Um, so it, it uses routing. It just say, okay, I know X uh, node ID, so FM can just send a routed message to X without knowing the physical information. And the federation layer is able to deliver the message because internally it's, it, it, it considers this ID as the virtual ID. So it was sent to whichever node whose ID is closest to X. Mm -hmm. But obviously X itself will be the node whose mm -hmm. ID is closest yeah. to X, right? So that node oh, okay. will, will actually get the message. So that's how we are using federation which you can see is very different from originally how we thought about it. Interesting. What's the difference between that and broadcasting? Okay, broadcasting is, uh, uh, if you consider the federation by itself, right, then of course you want to provide different kind of messaging mechanism and broadcast is one of the interesting things. But again, in our service fabric scenarios, we are not using broadcasts that much. There are only, uh, I think, two occasions where we are doing broadcast. One is the service table lookup information propagation. I, I don't know whether Mansu or Alex touched on this point or not. But basically, as the system um, has a lot of partitions, right, and every partition has primary and secondary, and we know failover manager has all the information, right? And as a client, you want to resolve, let's right, say, for this partition, where is the primary? Uh, so how do you get this information? Typically, the client just talk to any node in the federation. Uh, then that node will have the information. But how do they get that? Because the information, the authority is really at FM. So FM periodically does broadcast for all these uh, the, we call the service lookup table for all these entries to the entire ring so that every node will have this information. Mm. So that's one example where we are using broadcast. Another it's uh, uh, interesting but a very rare occasion. That's when we rebuild FM. Uh, again, that's uh, probably, I guess, Mansu probably the node. Yeah, we did, yeah, we touched Okay, okay. Yeah. Because in reality, rebuilding FM almost never happened because that's only needed when FM lost its data. Uh, but any, anyway, so our system does provide such uh, capability. If FM, FM does lose all its data, then it can perform a broadcast sent to all the nodes in the system, right? Saying, ah, hey, please give me your information so that I know what replicas you are hosting. 
the FM can reconstruct its view. Mm. That's another example where we use where, where we can use broadcast. Uh, I think that's probably the only two scenar scenarios for broadcast. Let's define reliable messaging. Right. So, so as we said, uh, in the federation, there are different uh, messaging delivery mechanism. Right. At the lowest level, that's point to point, which is basically a wrapper over TCP. And at the point to point layer, there's no guarantee. So it's really just best effort. Okay. Okay. Uh, then the next layer is routing. Routing provides some guarantee uh, in the sense that uh, within the timeout period, routing will keep keep retrying if a message cannot be delivered. And the sender requires an ACK message from the receiver, right? So unless an ACK is received, the sender will keep retrying. Mm -hmm. And not just the sender itself, and also the intermediate nodes along the path. Because like, like we said, routing may involve multiple hops. Right? Every node is trying to send to the next node, which is closest to the destination ID, according to his knowledge. Right? So this may involve multiple hops. OK, let, let me use the whiteboard. Yay, I think it worked. For the first, although it's a very simple case. Let's say uh, node A and node <coughs> Every node has a node ID. Let's just say node A, node ID is 10. And this may be I, node ID B is 90. Right? In, in reality, as I said, it's uh, really a 128 bit number. But for example, we just use very simple numbers. Sure. Suppose, let's say A only knows about C and D. C has a node ID of 20, D has a node ID of 30, right? Because in Federation, uh, one principle I did not mention is that we never assumed global knowledge. So every node only has partial knowledge of the entire Federation. Why? Because as I said, initially our design goal is to have millions of nodes. If you have millions of nodes, then of course it's not possible to keep track of everything in the Federation. Right. But in a data center, is let's say one thousand nodes. If uh, every node knows about every all the other one thousand nodes, maybe it's not too bad. But anyway, the Federation was designed that way, right? The principle is that we don't have global knowledge. At least we don't assume global knowledge. So it's possible that a only knows about C and D. Right? So A was sent the message to D. Because from its uh, perspective, D is the closest node to the destination, uh, which is 90. And D may know only about, let's say, E and uh, F. Let's say it's 40 and 50. So D was sent to 50. And let's say F knows about B, then F will directly send a message to 90. And uh, B was sent an ACK message to the origin of this routing message. B will also send an ACK message to the previous hops. Then 50 was sent an ACK to here. And 30 was sent an ACK to here as well. I think in some cases, this uh, we can optimize that way. But let's ignore those details. So that's how routing works, basically. Mm. Now, in terms of having to be really efficient, yeah, um, is this constant time, linear time? Like how fast? Well, like so, so theoretically, it's log n. Um, okay. Because uh, in the in the theoretical case, everyone knows node knows about its uh, expansion distances, etc. So uh, we have some proof saying that this is log n, uh, okay. n being the total number of nodes. But in practice, this log n stuff that no, almost never applies to the, to the real system. Typically, it's always almost always one or two hops most of the time, mm. uh, except for cases where, let's say, a lot of nodes are joining, joining the ring. Because why? It's not a million, no, million of nodes. Yeah. The routing table can really uh, has the capacity to keep track of everything that it ever knows about. So right. for example, if A ever talks to B, right, that's guaranteed that it will always remember B. Right. Because the routing table will never 
going to need to, let's say, remove some information from the routing table to claim extra memory, right? Memory is so cheap. And Southern nodes, it's really nothing today, right? <laughs> so what's the reason for the double ACK coming all the way to A? Is that to ensure oh, reliability or? Yeah, because every node is doing, the, it doing its own retry. So that's why if 90 does not send the ACK to 50, then 50 does not know this routing has completed. Right? Sure. So 15 may continue to try to resend, right? That's what we want to avoid. So, so go back to the uh, reliability guarantee. Basically, we guarantee that we will keep retrying within the timeout right. until either it's successful or it's timed out. Okay. And if timed out, do we assume that the node is down? Or? No, timed out can be anything, right? It could be really a transport problem or could be, well, the node is down, the not mean much, right? Because if 90 is down, then another node, let's say X, which has a node ID 80, for example, 80 will reply the message because it will become the next closest, closest node. node, right? So, like I said, we are not sending to a physical node, really. It's sending to the closest node, the logical entity, right? Pretty cool. So, yes. Mansoor sort of introduced us to the concept of a neighborhood when we were talking about failover and a little bit of where you can move replicas. Uh, how do you define the size of a neighborhood and then how do you keep that to like optimal amounts of knowledge rather than over flooding a node with too much data about the rest of the rank? Right, so, so the size of neighborhood is actually uh, configurable, but in, I think, all environments, except maybe, maybe some unit tests, everywhere we are using four as the neighborhood size on each side, which means that every node will have four nodes on each side, so eight nodes, eight neighbors in total. Mm -hmm. If the ring is big enough, right? If the ring only have five nodes, yeah, of then course you don't have five neighbors, right. uh, you don't have eight neighbors. But for, for a large enough ring, every node, uh, when the ring is stable, will have eight neighbors. Uh, the reason is that it cannot be a number that's too large. If it's too large, then uh, the, the requirement of tight information will be too big a burden, right? Because this node has to keep track of all these things. Uh, if it's too small, let's say every node only has one node on each side as its neighbor, then if these two nodes are down, you have a broken ring, right? Sure. Because the, the ring... Loses knowledge. Yeah, the, the, the link is broken. Hmm. And also, I assume that having smaller neighbor sets would reduce the efficiency of things like routing, for example, when you just don't have knowledge about more Node, uh, node IDs that you could have reached a request to? Theoretically, yes, but in practice, like I said, almost the not match because typically every node will know the Everybody else, thing, yeah. yeah. Hmm. At least after, after a while, you will know. So uh, while we're on this note, then could we uh, switch the conversation to talk a little bit more about failure detection? Sure. Yeah, sure. And, and then consequently a little bit about leasing. Right. Uh, failure detection uh, is also tied to this uh, concept of neighborhood. So every node is basically exchanging lease information with all its neighbors. Um, so between any, uh, any pair of nodes that, that are in the same neighborhood, periodically basically they are sending a heartbeat message saying that uh, I'm alive. How about you? That's basically what it does, right? So if between a pair of nodes, the lease is ever lost, then there are, there are two possibilities. One is that some node is down, or there's a network problem between the two nodes. If the other side is down, that's a simple case, right? So then, um, that's just the perfect failure detection scenario. We can say, I'm alive, the other side is down. Uh, the more complex case is when both sides are up, but lease is lost because of uh, transport issue. Hmm. So in that case, uh, in, our, in the federation, we require that um, communication channel is always available between nodes in the in, in the federation and especially during the neighborhoods so uh, the simple story is that 
if this ever happens between two good nodes, then we will kill one of the nodes. So only one will be able to survive. So that's the, in the resulting federation uh, layer, only all nodes will be able to talk to at least their neighbors, right? Uh, but we need to pick one, right? Let's say between A and B, if they, they, they lost their lease. Mm -hmm. uh, so who do we kill? So that's the uh, arbitration process. Uh, in the typical case, both A and B will send a request to the arbitrator, which is basically the C nodes in the ring, saying that uh, my lease with the uh, other side is broken. Then in the, in the simple case, whichever node that reports first will win the arbitration. So for example, A and B, if A goes to arbitration, ab goes to the arbitrator first, then A will win. A can continue to live and claim B to be done. And when B sends the same request to the arbitrator, the arbitrator will reject, saying that you have already lost because A has already claimed you as down. Then B will kill itself. That's the that's the simple case. Hmm. So B, <laughs> how does B come back up then? What does it require? After being killed, then you will just restart. After restart, then you can rejoin the ring. And in this case, for A and B, uh, A and B lost the lease to each other, but A and B also have other nodes that were attempting mm -hmm. to reach these guys with a heartbeat. Uh, so does that mean in this case that the neighbors were reporting that A and B were up, but A and B thought each other were down? Or is that in the case where A and B lose all of its leases? Uh, both are possible, right? If, let's say, only uh, A and B uh, they, they, they lost lease between uh, this pair and not to other nodes. Then the other nodes will later learn that either A is down or B is down after the fact, right? A or, A or B lost the arbitration. But in typical case, let's say, let's first about the perfect case. In the perfect case, A is really down. Then all its neighbors will be able to detect that. Right? Right. Everyone will report to the arbitrator and there's no conflict, right? The arbitrator only sees reports from its neighbor and not from A itself, then everyone is able to say, okay, A is done, right? Um, if let's say A, and because of some network problem, and A has lost lease with all its neighbors, then again, all the neighbors will report to the, to the arbitrator, and A will also report uh, to the arbitrator. But uh, typically, all the neighbors will win, and A will lose. There are various optimization we did in the in the system to prevent the bad case where A wins and all its neighbors <laughs> lost. <laughs> right? Because in such case, <laughs> yeah, A will kill all the other eight nodes. <laughs> right? uh, yeah. So th those are a lot. There are a lot of optimizations, and even um, recently, I think uh, probably uh, I don't remember the version number, but anyway, it's probably last month or the, the month before the last, uh, we uh, released a, a bunch of optimization in this area. Right. So right now, in, in the latest version, if A and B lost its lease, we allow them, there, there are cases we can allow both to survive without having to kill one of them. Hmm. Right. So previously, it's like, is a, Either you, either I win, you lose, yeah. or, or vice versa. Right? Now right. it's possible yeah. saying that yeah. okay, both can survive and both cannot claim the other side to be down. So hmm. that's and the so, can you dig into a little bit about how you pulled that off and also maintain guarantees for performance? Hmm. Does this it have is, a performance impact? This is not about performance, right? Because if both nodes are really up, mm -hmm. and if the, the uh, lease loss is just due to a, a transient network problem, then there's no real performance problem involved. Mm. Um, but the trade-off is, let's say, um, consider the case where A sends the arbitration request right, to the arbitrator. Mm -hmm. Now, we don't know whether B is actually alive or not. Right? Both are possible. So if we just say B is down, then the problem is that maybe later on B will actually send the application request, but at that time it's already too late for us to say B, you can you can continue to live. Um, so 
when we are doing the optimization, we can we what we are trying to do is to tell a. So initially, I cannot give you the the decision. Okay. Let's wait for a while to see whether B will report. Mm -hmm. If B does report, then I will come back to A saying, okay, B is actually alive. So both of you guys try to reestablish this. But if after some small amount of time B did, did not report, then we can tell A saying, okay, B is actually it's more likely to be down. So now you can claim B as down. Uh, but the trade-off is that now the failure detection is kind of delayed, hmm. right? Because you have to wait for this short amount of time so that we, we allow B to, to also report. So that's the trade-off. Uh, nothing, uh, nothing is the uh, free lunch kind of, right? Agreed. Yeah, but we, we have another optimization, which is before we lose the lease, um, a and B, because typically the, the lease messages will, will go through very quickly. Let's say A and B, they, they need to re-establish lease, or uh, I should say they need to renew the lease every 10 seconds, let's say. Typically, they will be able to do this, uh, let's say, within the first, uh, let's say, a few milliseconds. Typically, they can do that. But if after, let's say, five seconds, they are still not able to do that, then they can they can suspect that some something might be wrong, right? Either the network has problem, or the other side may be down, etc. So they can send a request to the arbitrator first, but this time they are not saying that uh, I'm suspecting the other side is down. They are merely saying I'm still alive. So if later on the other side reports me to be to be the suspect. Uh, please remember that I just sent you this message. <laughs> so, so, so preemptive. Yeah, right. yeah. So when the arbitrator got this message, <laughs> then and, and after that it, it received the request, then it will has more chance to say, okay, please wait, because I just received a message from this guy. So it's more likely that it's actually alive. Hmm. Right? Well, we, we cannot go into the, the detail, but... I hope this gives you some rough idea, right? Because yeah. if we talk about the details, there are really a lot of such details. <laughs> I get, but guess what? We're open source, and at some yeah, yeah, point yeah, we're going to sure. upgrade, we're going to update the repo, right? and right. it'll have your code in there. Right. Yeah. People can go look at it. Right. So one of the things you mentioned uh, is the notion of arbitrators. Right. So we haven't talked too much about seed nodes uh, at all, actually. Right, right, right. Uh, right. But you know, these are special nodes that help with operations as service fabric, for the most part, to put it simply. Right, right. Uh, what starts to happen when lease is lost across seed nodes? Seed uh, nodes, for, for, the, for the lease, there's nothing special about the seed node. Uh, if a C node lose lease and it, it lost the arbitration, it will go down. It's the same. But what if you, like... The arbitrators themselves, like who, how are you choosing what, what C node is the arbitrator? Every C node is the arbitrator. I see. Okay. Yeah. And the decision is made by a pool of machines or by the first one that can... The work? decision is made independently by all the C nodes. Uh, when we say um, win the arbitration, we really mean win the arbitration from a majority quorum from the C nodes. Yeah. Hmm. So it's actually kind of like a, a jury more than an arbitrator, actually. So the arbitrator is the judge, and there has to be a quorum of, mm -hmm. of information yeah. upon which it can make its decision. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it's not a political thing. Right? It's purely based on data. So <laughs> this leads <laughs> us to another job. incredible uh, uh -huh. and critically important distributed system type of thing that you do in Federation, and that is, of course, leader election. So okay. people who use service fabric don't have to know how to build those types of algorithms because you're doing that for them. Uh, we talked about this in pretty much all of the um, reliability stuff. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's very important. It is important. And it's related. This is the layer that provides the ability for that to even exist. Oh, great. Right? Yeah. So that's what makes this cool. Well, <laughs> Federation is cool, man. Yeah, we keep saying that and he keeps laughing at us. This is the theme of this video. <laughs> but no, it is. In the, in the, uh, in the DHT, then um, lead election is basically... How should I say it? Actually, routing is itself a lead election process. Right? Okay. Because you, when you are routing to a target virtual ID X, you are basically uh, selecting a leader for this X. And who is the leader? The leader is the node whose ID is closest to this X. So that's the leader election. 
mm. in federation. So it's as simple as that. Wow. There's no real, real like a pr protocol to elect a leader, right? But there's a, there's a protocol for you to find out who the leader is, is yeah. which is routing. Right? But again, in service fabric, actually the leader is the failover manager. There's only one case where we uh, rely on federation to do the lead election, which is the the failover manager's manager. It's the FMM. Yes. Right. Perfect. So, yeah, FMM is a node in the federation whose ID is closest to zero. So that's this a single special case where the lead election comes from federation layer directory. Hmm. Everything else after this bootstrapping point, okay. FM is the leader, basically. Interesting. Wow. Makes sense. Yeah. Right? Totally makes sense. So when when you were working on the federation, what were some of the sort of the biggest challenges you ran into? And now retrospectively, if you were to redesign it, what are some things you might have done differently? Well, first of all, I, I shouldn't say uh, I'm doing the federation, right? Like I said, yeah. when we, when you formed a new federation, the service fiber team, almost every member worked on federation. Correct. Right? And uh, first layer. Before that, yeah, then Kapoor, Rich, and, uh, and I, we three people worked on this federation. Um, to, to answer your question, though, I think, as I said previously, federation is really, when we design the federation, it's, it was for a completely different scenario. It was not for the data center, right? Mm. So if we know it was just for data center, then, for example, like I said, uh, the uh, requirement of having having no global knowledge is no longer that important, right? That's one thing. And also, federation layer, even... Uh, even the current implementation is actually very different from the initial implementation when we designed in 2005. Uh, for example, this log n thing. <laughs> Initially, log n is very important because that's for many of nodes. Right. But like I said, in data center, log n is Small. you will, almost you will never see log n. It's almost not important at, at all. Yeah. Yeah. So. But, but I mean, what would you have done differently in terms of, you know, any of the layers that you worked on? Like you, the things that you've specifically designed and, and put a lot of your IQ and effort and hours into, like now you have different tools or different, you know, it's not distributed hash tables aren't like the cool thing in 2018. Um, like what sort, and now that you're sort of focused on data center and not the e-home kind of. Mm -hmm. media, distributed media system that you guys were, you know, working on back in the day. Um, can you talk a little bit about, so focus on the data center, like what is there that you've been able to do to take advantage of the fact that you're not worrying about login, you're not worried about a million notes? Right, but like I said, uh, in, the, in the federation layer right now, a bunch of complexity is because we want to avoid any global data, right? Uh, Every node can only know a small portion of the of the entire federation, or oh, may right for, for for a very large federation. Mm. But in a data center, we can remove that. Then yeah, some algorithm may be able to be designed in a, in a different way, or maybe for example, it, it's not too bad to rely on some global knowledge. For example, because right now another fundamental design principle of federation layer is that it need to be self-sufficient. So it does not rely on any external knowledge or external store, for example. Mm. Um, but I think that, that still has its merit. For example, um, data center is not the only place where we run service fabric, right? We have uh, on-premises service fabric rings. So where, again, you cannot rely on, for example, uh, let's say SQL Azure, because we could use SQL Azure as the authority, for example, to store this federation node list, right? right. That, that solves the problem easily, right? But 
in situations where such a store is not available, then you cannot rely on that. Right. Right. So, so it's, it's not that simple an answer because although our main scenario is data center, but we are not like entirely on data center. Yeah. So in some ways it's good that we started out with right, a different right, scenario. Right, right, right. right. For you, sure. Yeah, because you design uh, all case solution. Mm. And it worked with very little knowledge, mm -hmm. and now just the fact that we have more knowledge makes it more efficient. It doesn't make it bad or wrong. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It right. just means that we're more optimized than we thought we might be. Right. Yeah, because uh, we're not operating at the scale. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, this this code is open source. So if anybody out there wants to right. play around with some optimizing algorithms here, go for it. Yeah. Right. And uh, if you you guys are ambitious, I mean the. the uh, in the open source community, you can try to just take federation layer and build your own distributed system. That's entirely possible. Right on. What would be uh, your main advice for somebody who might try to do that? Because whenever, if you want like something like federation, you want failure uh, detection, right? You want messaging. You want to know what members are, are up, what members are down, right? Then federation layer is the a perfect choice because everything yeah. is already built there and it's kind of being proved in larger scale or very small scale. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of making me think of things like blockchain almost where yeah, like yeah, people yeah. are working on implementations of right. that's the buzz today for distributed systems computing, right? Like right. have multiple machines that can cluster together, do work together right. and share proof that they've achieved that work. Right. Mm -hmm. And it seems like if we can find ways to... Yeah, almost all distributed systems, if you don't have, already have the, the lower layer, right? Then you could say, okay, I just pick federation layer and stuff around there rather than try to build everything from scratch. I mean, federation alone gives you all right, of the basic right, distributed right. computing guarantees mm -hmm. that we talked about in the Gopal mm -hmm. interview as well. Mm -hmm. True. Like that are just totally abstracted away from you. You could focus at a higher level. Right. Build your system on top of Lou and company's work, Mahale and Gopal and others. Yeah, um, awesome. Dude, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Last, Finally. last fun question for cool. you. Um, what is one piece of advice you'd give to anybody about anything in the world? Anything at all? Anything in the world. I, I think um, one thing we have seen is that the future is really very hard to predict, right? Like I said, initially when we designed this thing, we never imagined it would be in this form. And federation today is only a small portion of the entire system. Right, so it just the, the world is keep changing. You need to remember that. That's the only advice. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much for your time, Luke. Okay. No problem. I really appreciate it.